And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map. And that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church. And when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. If we could see the result of all that God does in every service for the Word of God is lifted and preached, we'd be dumbfounded and amazed at what God does. It's just not about uh, an attendance number on a board. How many people can you get coming faithfully to your church? The purpose of church is not for attendance. The purpose of church is for growth. But if we look in the mirror, we're not perfect either. And the truth is, again, you can't change the other person. You can't get them saved. You can't change their faults. But God can. But you can change your own faults through God's help. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, come to the end of what's best for you, Start doing what's best for the sake of the Savior. Here we are with another episode of Sandy Creek Stirrings, a podcast where our goal is to stir you up for the cause of Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're a church member or a preacher or whatever you may be, our goal is to have an episode here for you that'll help you and apply to you each and every single one. Something you can take home and use. One preacher put it this way, he wanted his message to be shoe leather Christianity, something you could take home and walk in. That's the same thing I want for Sandy Creek Stirrings. I want it to be shoe leather episodes, things that you can take home and walk in. I hope that episode that you listened to last week, of course, we're doing a continuation of that episode today on the subject of funerals. And uh, so this is really a message that's kind of directed, though this will apply to everybody. If you listen to the fu- of the funeral episode last week, you'll know that whether you're a preacher or someone sitting in the pew, how that episode can be a help to you. If you're someone in the pew, you now have an idea of how your pastor has to prepare for a funeral, how you can help him, and how to pray for him. Prayer is so important. And then also, if you're a preacher, if, especially if you're a young preacher like myself, you're learning how to do a funeral. How do I How do I make this work? I've never done one before. Maybe I did one and it didn't go so well. I want to get it better. And um, these are great episodes to help you. And so we talked about all the preparation and the many different things. Um, And so we're going to continue that today. I'm, of course, joined with uh, my pastor, my father, Pastor Patrick Jimenez. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, so glad to be a part. Yes, sir. And uh, so, of course, we talked about last week, I'm not going to review everything we discussed, but we talked about why I think you're the perfect person um, to teach on the subject of funerals, at least through the podcast format, um, because you just do such a wonderful job. So I'm looking forward to the rest of it today. It's helping me think about some things. I've never done a funeral, and uh, maybe we'll get raptured out, and I'll never have to do one, and, and I'm okay with that. I'm and, okay with uh, that, too. But, but um, anyway, it's good, a good idea to be prepared, and so we're going to keep learning today in preparation. Um, let me give you something real quick that I have learned from listening to some other people on funerals as well. One thing Dr. Jack Hiles did when he prepared for funerals, I don't know if you're going to mention this or not. I told you this. Oh, he got so, it. From, he probably got it from me. He probably got it from me. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't think that works that <laughs> no, way. But um, he, before doing a funeral, he committed that he would pray for four hours before every funeral. 
pray wow. for four hours just to get the power of God. Um, that's good advice. Maybe that's something for you to do as well. Oh, I have not prayed four hours. No, I don't mean I don't mean like you specifically. I mean to the listener. This is for you, listener. Pray for four. Oh, hours. I am listening, and uh, I'm, yeah, I guess you are. <laughs> no, so. that's a great advice. I had never thought about spending that time, that much time in prayer before a funeral. And uh, wow, that's actually really great advice. Really good advice. Well, there's there's a little tidbit I picked up from somewhere. I pick. I'm listening. In case you don't know me personally, I spend a lot of time listening to preaching, and so I'm picking up stuff constantly from everywhere. Hey, young preacher, by the way, take good notes. You write something down, you're going to forget. The shortest pencil lasts longer than the best memory. All right, so write it down. I'll, I'll say it again. Shortest the shortest pencil, pencil lasts, lasts longer, longer than the best memory. No, I think it it's. Better it's than better the than the longest memory. Yeah, it's something like that. You you <laughs> it, you get what I'm trying to you say. Should have right? wrote that I down. You, I should have I should have written that one down. Take good notes. We talked about that last week. Take good notes and remember where you put the notes. Exactly. If you have any questions, you can email me Joshua at Sandy Creek dot com. Joshua at Sandy Creek dot com. I don't give this tidbit every episode, but if you're a young preacher and you want to talk more specifically with Pastor Patrick Jimenez on the subject, you can find his information or our contact information on Victory Springs Independent Baptist Church, Victory Springs Independent Baptist Church, or just go to vsibc.org. Again, that's vsibc.org if you'd like to get in contact with him directly. I won't give any other commercials, any other ads for what you can do to support Sandy Creek Stirrings. We just hope you enjoy today's episode. So go ahead and buckle up. We're about to fly. And let's go over to you, preacher. Go ahead and give us what we're talking about today. Okay. Well, last time we talked about the preparation of funerals. And when we turned off the mics last time and we're done with the last episode, we actually talked about how there's so much more to prepare for. Um, I mean, it would take several episodes. There's so much involved, but we can't do it all, obviously, uh, now or here. But if anybody out there listening wants some more, especially if you're a young preacher and you say, boy, I could use a bit more help or some more advice, give me a call. Um, I'm, I'm available and uh, to help because uh, I just want you to be successful in what you do for the Lord. So that's a, that's a blessing there. We talked about the celebrate the person, cherish the memories, and then... Um, the third thing that I do at funerals is contemplate eternity. That's what a funeral is for. Contemplate eternity. Uh, my goal as a preacher in everything I do is to edify Christ and to promote the gospel. Um, the funeral is one of the greatest opportunities a preacher has to present the gospel. I'm not saying it's the easiest, but it's one of the greatest opportunities because... Uh, of course, God tells us that uh, in Ecclesiastes 7, 1, the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. Birth is an exciting time, new beginning, a whole new life. Death, it's the end of life. It's where we begin thinking about eternity, and it's not until death takes place that people often will turn their eyes to what's coming after and think about that. And so what a great opportunity we have as preachers uh, as Christians, to be able to share the gospel at a time where people are literally thinking what comes next. Exactly and right. so uh, what a great opportunity. And you don't want to fail that. I've seen too many preachers fail at the gospel. They they get, um, they get feel uh, whether uncomfortable to give the gospel at a funeral. They feel um, uh, that maybe they might offend somebody if they get too too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Too direct, direct too long. Yeah, too direct like about the gospel. making it a serious thing of they're either in heaven or hell. Like exactly. That might be offensive, but um, that's the truth. Yeah, and so... And there's a right way to handle it again. There is. Uh, but you want to be careful as a preacher that you that you don't shy away from giving a clear presentation of the gospel because you're like, well, man, you know, I don't want to you know offend anybody. Um, listen, I, I'd rather offend somebody than offend God. Right. And truth is, I'd rather their spirit get offended and that they hear about Christ. Uh, because this could be, for some of those people, their only one and only shot at hearing the gospel. And do not fail. We were just recently, me and you were at a funeral. And uh, what a waste of time that your funeral was. Um, because yeah. the the preacher there had a great opportunity to give the gospel, and he just put it around the whole thing, never gave a clear... I honestly, And you could tell, being another preacher there, he knew how to give the planet. Like, he knew how to get saved. He just didn't do it clearly at all. No, he just it, there was the there was the berry bush in the middle, and he just kept walking around it, walking yeah. around it, and he would reach out, but he would never just get in and get the blueberries. I I don't know how else to put it. That's how I kind of see it in my <laughs> mind. He just kept beating around the bush. He 
he, yeah. he never got into it. Please make it clear, I beg yeah. you. When I when I was at that funeral and we were standing next to each other, we kept looking back at each other, back and forth. Well, um, there was a lot of reasons to look back and forth. But anyway. Oh, that was a mess. But uh, But I stood there and pretended that I was a lost person, that I did not know how to be saved, and was looking for an answer of how to be saved. I left that funeral it pretended to be lost. I left it lost. Um, I literally left that funeral thinking, well, as long as I, I, I believe in Jesus and I, you know, I, I think I'm okay, I'm okay. Yeah, and by believe in Jesus, like believe he was alive, yeah. basically. It's not belief in placing your faith in him for heaven exactly. or to, for your hope of salvation. It's placing, like just believing, yeah, I believe Jesus is a real person, so I yeah. must be going to well, heaven. Well, I believe in Jesus that, you know, yeah, exa- that he existed, that kind of thing. Anyway, it was just, a, it was a, a failed opportunity, and that preacher's going to have to answer to God for that, um, because there was that. a lost person at that funeral that wanted to know the gospel, Sure. and uh, I had the opportunity later to go back and witness to him, because he asked my wife uh, how to be saved, and I was able to follow up there. So, yeah, anyway, long story. Uh Different. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me give a couple things here, real quick, when we're dealing with funerals. Um, as I said before, there's different types of funerals. There's the uh, at church, there's at the funeral home, a memorial service. A memorial service is basically there's no body there, it's just living out the memory or remembering. Is that what they would also term as a celebration of life? Celebration, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Celebration of life, memorial service. They create um, all these same different thing. terms for it. They do. Um, and part of it is to escape the. The idea of seriousness. Death. Yes. Uh, so then there is the um, graveside service. Uh, then there's the open, closed casket, all those different things. Um, but so there's different ways to approach each one. So let's talk about whether it's a casket or memorial service. Um, I kind of do the same thing, um, whether it's at church or funeral home. Here at church, I have a little bit more control, but I do the same type of order of service. Graveside is going to be different. So sure. the others, I kind of lump together, and I do them the same way, same type of service schedule or order of service. The graveside, I do totally different because of the scope of what's happening at a graveside. Um, and uh, a lot of times a graveside happens after the service, the funeral service. Um, right. And so you obviously don't want to make a whole nother second service out of that. Sure. Um, so different ways. So let me give you a couple things that I've learned along the way. One of them are some go-to Bible verses. Uh, with the idea of this, our number one aim is getting to the gospel. Whether the person was saved, whether they were lost, whether they were backslidden, whether they were a faithful servant of God, or whether you don't have a clue because you don't even know the person and you don't know if they have a testimony. Sure. Um, the idea is to give the gospel at every single one because a lost person's family, they need to hear the gospel. Exactly. A saved person's family... Well, the safe person wants you to give the gospel. Right. So the gospel is the main thing, and you want to be direct, but there's different avenues to get to the gospel. Sure. And that is where it gets a little tricky. Um, knowing which avenue you take uh, to get to the gospel. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense to what I'm saying. No, it absolutely does. Okay. If you're, We've been giving person in the pew tips all throughout this series. If you're a person in the pew and you've got a family member who passed away, make it easy on your pastor Tell him, Pastor, we want you to give a clear plan of salvation. And now he knows. Boom. Just now he's gonna do it anyway if he's if he's if you know if he's, a real if he's worth his salt, he's gonna do it anyway. But make it easy on him by just saying, We want you to do this. Please do this. Absolutely. So obviously I'm gonna quote scripture, and there are some go to scriptures. Um, twenty third Psalm. People are comforted in death with the 23rd Psalm. I honestly don't understand that because 23rd Psalm— I was just about to say that, and I thought, <laughs> that probably sounds bad. I no. mean, all the all Scripture is supposed to be comforting, but why is it just—I mean, yea, though I, I guess I understand— Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, but you just tasted of shadow death. Of death it's, it's, shadow of death. You know, and, and in context, it's part of the Messianic Psalms. Um, it, it fits with Psalm 22, then Psalm 23, then Psalm 24. That's a different subject for a different time. And it's anyway. a Psalm about living. It's it's a song about living and living and that's under why it's the, shepherd. the shadow of death, not so, actually death. Yeah, so it's one of those things, but it's on almost yeah, sure. like ninety five percent. It makes it makes sense to a degree, but yeah. yeah. So it's on it's on ninety five percent of the you know little obituary cards that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a comfort. So use I, it. I always use it. Every every Western movie I've ever watched 
They they have the they have the funeral where the gunfighter just got killed. Doesn't matter. He's a terrible person. They're going to read the psalm, the twenty third <laughs> psalm, psalm over him. So exactly. And so twenty third psalm is one that I fit in there and read. Um, and then there's some other go tos. If the person is eighty years or older, I read this scripture and I I learned this from Pastor Don Strange, uh, Psalm ninety verse ten. Uh, when speaking of the person, I'll say, you know, this person was eighty four years old. You know, the Bible deals with with them specifically. In Psalm 90 verse 10 it says, the days of our years are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, that's 80 years, yet their strength and labor, um, yet is their strength and labor sorry for it is soon cut off and we fly away. You know what's amazing about that? Even at 84, to them, life is still short. You know, yeah. it flew by. And so there's a way to recognize and honor, you know, the age. Um, some go-to verses, of course, is uh, one that I like to quote at some por- portion in there is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. I might read the, the whole thing, or I might read one or two, and that's, of course, let not your heart be troubled. That's a good one. Yeah. And that is a great one. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I talk about that prepared place. Um, in fact, that was probably the that was the scripture that I used at the very first funeral I ever preached when I had just surrendered to preach. I think I told that in the last episode. Um, and I preached a message about a prepared place, a promised place. And then there was another P. I forgot what it was. But um, so that's a great portion of Scripture uh, to to read as well. Um, and so those are some good ones. Um, but the ultimate goal is getting to the gospel. And I said there's different avenues to get to the gospel. If the person is lost, okay, Josh, or I don't know their testimony, um, and I and I have a pretty good idea sometimes whether people are lost or saved. As I mentioned in our previous episodes, sometimes I get asked to preach funerals of people. I don't even have a clue who they are. I've never met them. Uh, the, their family don't even come to our church. They just needed a preacher. Um, and so they found a preacher who's willing to um, help them. Uh, not a lot of preachers do that. Right. A right. lot of preachers, um, you know, won't do that. And uh, I make myself available. Why? Because I, I, I'm... I'm not just the pastor of the people here, but I'm the preacher in the community. I want people to know they can come to me no matter who they are. Sure. And so people, well, strangers, and they're like, "Hey, I, you know, preach? Would you preach, conduct a funeral?" And I'll say, "Sure." You know, and um, and be honest with you, it's it's very nerve wracking um, because it's you don't know the testimony. Now I'm going to give a little bit of advice, Josh. When you preach your first funeral, if that person is lost. Do not. Stand up in that funeral and say, that person's in hell today. Yeah. That's not going to help the family. Sure. Now, no. when you preach the gospel, they're going to figure it out. Okay, yeah. Let the Holy Spirit show them. You do not have to show them. Um, I do not reference somebody in, uh, you know, in, in hell. Now, if they're saved and have that testimony... I'm jumping all over that thing right there. I'm going to let them know, hey, this, you know, so-and-so made a decision to be saved. They got saved when they were 13 or, you know, whatever. If I led them to the Lord, um, you know, I I do that. I will actually talk about their death day. Uh, I'll give three dates. And uh, if I know the date that they got saved, I'll, I'll do three dates. I'll say, you know, there's three important dates in this person's life. Number one, and I'll give the first day, I'll give their birthday. That's when they became physically born. Um, So I'll talk about it. Then I talk about their death day, the day that they died. I'll give that date. But then I'll talk about the third day, which is is, uh, the most important one. And you better have this third date before you have your death date. And that's the born again day when you got saved. And so what I do is I give those dates as well. Do I do that at every service? Do I do that at every funeral? No. Every funeral I do is completely different. Now, there's an order of service that I stick to, sure. but yeah. it's kind of like, you know, Sunday service. I've got an order of service, but not every message is the same. You have to be adaptable. I so, do. You really do. You have to be adaptable for sure. So basically, you do have to be adaptable in that way because every situation is different and every funeral has its different criteria, different things that you have to navigate around or do according to family and this and those things. Um, so um, basically, I am never going to uh, allude to someone being in hell. That's not going to help the family. That's actually going to turn them off from the gospel. Um, But when I'm done with the gospel, they're going to know because the Holy Spirit's going to convict their heart. 
Um, so I am very careful in choice of words and how I do things. If someone is lost, um, I will present, and I've done this, I've said, you know, uh, one thing John wants you to know, there's, there's something John wants you to know, and he wants you to know how uh, about heaven and how to go there. And because he does. If he's it in doesn't hell, matter which it, place he's in, he wants you to know. Exactly. Yeah. And so he wants you to know. So I'm very careful in how I do that. Um, you know, have, uh, there's something they want you to know. And um, and so I'll deal with that. And uh, sometimes if the family has asked me to present the gospel, I will let the people at the funeral know that. So they don't say that I'm just taking advantage of a hostage right. situation. You know, they, Yeah, it kind um, of levels off any visitors are there who are like, look at him just putting his own spin on this. You tell yes. them the family told me to do this. Exactly. And so if you're a church member and uh, or a you know, Christian, please let the preacher know he has free liberty to give the gospel. Um, that just unties his hands, and I'm able to stand before the, the people there at the funeral and say, hey, you know, uh, sister so-and-so, you know, asked if I would present the gospel because this is something their loved one believed in, or if, even if they didn't, I still have uh, their permission. So I will give that. Uh, and then what I do with the message part is, Josh, I try not to go over 15 uh, minutes, 20 minutes max. Um, and uh, so, because we've already had the memories, we've already had maybe a video or some songs per time. Uh, I'm not, I try to keep a funeral to about 45 minutes, no more than that. Um, but basically, when I get to that gospel part of that message, now I'm direct. And I am totally upfront. I don't beat around the bush. I will take them through the plan of salvation. Uh, whether I am quoting the scriptures of the Romans roadmap, whether I am quoting other scriptures and giving illustrations. Um, one of the illustrations I do, and I don't have time to do it on your podcast, but a great illustration that I do is the one where I pretend I have a million dollars and I put it in my Bible and say, if you want the million dollars, all you have to do is take my Bible. And, um, and I give that illustration referencing he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God hath not life. And I talk about how God has eternal life. It's a gift and he places it in Jesus. If you want eternal life, you got to take Jesus. Um, and so some people out there might be questioning, you know, Hey, that sounds like an interesting, you know, uh, uh, illustration. illustration. Uh, you can call me. I'll tell it to you in detail. Um, but it's a great one. I use that all the time, um, and I'll use it at funerals because I want people to see a visual picture uh, of of salvation and what it represents. Um, I have had um, in an not necessarily an altar call, you would say, because I'm not asking people to come to an altar, but I have an invitation. I guess you could call it at the at funerals. An I invitation to get saved. Yeah, exactly. So I will invite people at the end of the funeral. I'll say, now listen, if you're here and you're not saved, uh, I want you to come see me at the end of the funeral. And please give me that opportunity to show you how to be saved. Um, I've had one or two do that. Um, then there are times where during the invitation, I will say, now listen, um, if anybody here would like to accept Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that now. And I said, we're gonna, I'm going to pray. Now, my prayer doesn't save you. I can't pray you into heaven. And just because you repeat Please define this, that, yes. Yeah, yeah. I define it. I do not get up and say, hey, you know, repeat this prayer after me and you'll be saved. I define it very carefully. My prayer does not save you. Just because you repeat this prayer does not mean you're saved. Okay? I am. If your heart is under conviction that you're going to end up in hell one day and you need to be saved, this is your opportunity for you to pray and ask Christ into your heart and put your faith in Him. And I'm going to pray, and you can repeat the prayer with me, but you got to make it your own prayer. And I'll go through, and I'll actually pray at the end of the funeral, out loud. And I've had people raise their hand, and I'll say, okay, who prayed that prayer? With their heads bowed and eyes closed, did anybody in here pray that prayer and ask Christ to be their Savior? And I've had two, three people raise their hand. I've had one raise their hand. Um, I don't do that every service. I'm very careful to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Yeah, um, There are some services where I don't feel at liberty by the Holy Spirit to lead in prayer and to do that, I'll invite folks to come and see me. Then there's others where the Holy Spirit says, now's the time. And I will literally pray and have folks that want to be saved to make it their prayer and to to accept Christ their Savior. Um, but I'm very careful to follow the Holy Spirit's leading on that as well. Um, 
And so, you know, that's something uh, that you want to be careful of. Uh, if they're saved and have a testimony of salvation, run with that. That is like gold right there. Um, and so I talk about when they got saved, how did they get saved? What did they have to understand to be saved? Uh, and so I, I, I take that full plan of salvation. So when you are sitting there, you are going to get under conviction or you are going to be uh, rooting me on if you're saved. You'll be like, yeah, well, this is it. You know, he's giving the plan of salvation. They need to know this. Um, and so, uh, and then I'll find those who are uncomfortable, you know, they're sitting there and boy, they don't want to hear that. And you can watch them squirm. And, um, one, that's one of the great times if you're in a funeral, pray for that preacher yeah, and pray for the Holy spirit to just overcome hardened hearts. Uh, pray, pray, pray. Um, and so the gospel is the number one thing. Do not be a preacher that fails that opportunity. Um, because what a great opportunity it is for those hurting hearts, ones that are thinking about eternity and death, to not be given a chance to learn how to remedy uh, that situation and avoid, um, you know, uh, hell altogether by being saved. So I, I do that. I quote scripture. I, I, I preach a message. But then again, I keep it short, but it's to the point. Um, and so uh, if you have any questions or anything, Josh, or, or, or you know, add, please, you know, please do. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a thing called a graveside, and I want to hit that for a second. Uh, when we're done with the service, the the preaching service, if the family has a meal afterwards, um, I invite them and say, now, you know, when I'm all done, I'll say, now, you know, the family would like to invite you to a dinner over here at the fellowship hall or whatever it is. Um, or if it's a graveside afterwards, I'll say, you know, we have a graveside service. We invite you to come to the graveside service. That'll be, you know, our final time to just say goodbye. And not everybody comes to the graveside. They've just sat through the funeral service. Um, but you'll have a good number that will come to the graveside, especially if it's on property or not far away. Sure. Um, yeah. So you have the graveside. The graveside is where they will then take the casket. They'll put it there. They'll have the wreath of flowers overlaid on the casket. Um, they'll have the family sit on the front row under that little canopy. And then others gather around. The funeral director will normally not start the thing. Um, they normally... Uh, and this has happened 100% of the times. I'm not saying it happens 100% of the time, but for me it has. Basically, I stand there, and the funeral director will just let me start when I'm ready. Sure. And so I give uh, as many people an opportunity to um, to get around that little canopy in um, earshot distance. Um, if I see some people, you know, just pulling up in their car uh, and we're about to start, I'll say, you know what, we're going to give it just another moment and let these loved ones make it here for the graveside. The graveside is only going to be 10 or 12 minutes, 15 at the most. Um, it's very short. They've already heard the gospel. They've already heard the message right. at the funeral. The graveside is kind of like the final goodbye. And um, when I have everybody around... Uh, Josh, this is also another important thing to memorize or to understand. At the graveside, you need to lift your voice loud sure, so everybody can hear. Most preachers fail at that because what happens is they're using a regular talking voice and only the people in the front row can hear. Nobody else is hearing a thing of what they're saying. You might as well not have even showed up. I get loud and I want everybody there to hear what I'm saying because it needs to be heard. Um, sure. So uh, I will lift up my voice and I will get really, really loud and project. And I'll say, you know, thank you for coming to the graveside today. And, you know, we're going to be saying our final goodbyes. And what I do at the graveside uh, portion of this ceremony is I'll give just another uh, illustration. I'll say now, you know, in this casket lies a body and that body is the suitcase that so-and-so lived in. They're not really there. That's not where they are. What we're doing here is we're just committing the body back to the ground like the Lord said would take place, but they're living on forever somewhere. <coughs> Excuse me, had to cough. And so they're living on somewhere. And uh, I just expressly will tell the family what to expect over the next few days. I'm directing this, directing this at the family. And I will begin at the graveside and say, now, you know, we're saying goodbye here. And this is going to be the tough part because you're now going to walk away with the reality of that separation physically yeah. uh, from here on out. And it's okay to be honest with the, be honest. what's happening. Sure. Absolutely. And I'll say, look, you'll never be able to hug him again. 
you know, the wife will never have that one to, to keep them warm in the winter and, and, uh, you know, snuggle with, or, you know, the kids give a hug. And I said, you know, this is where it gets real and this is where it gets really hard. And I will tell them it's okay to grieve. It's okay to cry. It's okay. Yeah, there are going to be days where you struggle. The first night alone is hard. The first week is going to be so difficult. Little things, a smell, a particular food, a particular picture in a home, a particular shirt that all of a sudden you realized was still in the dirty hamper and now you have to wash it. All those things are going to trigger the emotions and it's going to be difficult. But understand this, that with each passing day, it will get a little lighter and you can begin to breathe again. There will be a time where you breathe and it's not that you've forgotten them. It's not that you don't love them, but time does bring a healing agent and you will find that you can begin to breathe again and you'll begin to stop the crying. And I expressed to the people this little thing and I picked it up from a movie. I don't even know what movie it was. I think it was a movie. And it was talking about a loved one. When someone passes away, um, you'll never fully be healed by that. And the movie referenced and said it was like losing a limb. You know, you lose your arm. Now it may heal, but you'll always live the rest of your life knowing something's missing. Sure. And life will never be the same. You have to understand that. But yes, you will heal to where it doesn't hurt anymore, but there'll still be something missing. And that's because of the memories you shared. And I'm letting them know the truth of it. I normally will have my wife or girl sing an acapella song, Graveside. And that's normally what I start with. I'll say, thank you for coming. We're going to have a song real quick before you know we move on in our graveside service. And it will not be long. And I let people know they're standing out there in the sun. Sure. They're hot. They're sweating. And I want them to know it won't be long. We'll be here 10 minutes, if max. But this is such an important part of, of our service today, this graveside. So please don't miss it. Um, and so... I uh, will have my wife and girl sing. I'll give a brief little thing, a final, you know, goodbye. Then we'll pray. And then um, what I do is then I will go down the line and lead the way. Most people don't know this, but normally you form a line starting uh, with I'm looking at the crowd or the front row. You start with the right front and I go down and I'll shake their hand or hug them and let them know that I'm here for anything they have. You know, if they, if they need their preacher and I will invite folks and I'll say, now I'm directing this because funeral directors don't do this. I am directing this and I'll say, now, listen, you know, we want you just to come and just give the family one, one final hug around the neck and just let them know you love them and that you're there. And if they need anything, you let them know that you're there to help them. And I said, so why don't you just follow my lead and I'll lead the way down and shake each hand and then I'll find people will follow me. Something else that Pastor Strange did <clears throat> um, that I do and I ask permission from the family to do this. Um, Pastor Strange uh, one time had uh, invited the folks to come uh, and take a flower off the spray, the casket spray, the one that covers the casket, that large bouquet of flowers. And he invited them to come and he said, I want you to come and get a flower, a rose. He said, just pull it off. They just come right out. And he said, you can dry that and just have a little memento of, you know, your dad sure. or yeah. uncle or whatever. And, you know, take that and just keep that as a memento. And you'll be surprised at how many people will come and pull a sprig off and just hold on to that and just cherish that. It's their final little memento. It was touching the casket. I always ask the family permission to do that for sure. Me. And what I'll do is I'll approach the family and say, now I'm going to ask your, you know, your permission. Uh, sometimes uh, families don't mind if people will take a little flower, they'll dry them. I said, what'll happen is if you leave today they're going to take that spray of flowers and throw it in the dumpster. Yeah. I let them know the reality. They're going to throw that in the dumpster and it has, you know, after today it's, it has no meaning. But if you will let folks come by, loved ones take a flower and dry that flower and they'll have it to just keep in their Bible or as a keepsake and they'll always have that cherished memory. This was touching the casket, my final, you know, little closure. And I have not had a family refuse that yet because sure. when they know it's just going in the dumpster, it's like, what? People don't realize <laughs> you know, what happens to those things right, afterwards. Right. Um it's kinda like all those yeah, it's true. <laughs> You're about to say something, but you stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say it's kinda like all those d donuts at the end of the day at Dunkin' Donuts, they all go in the dumpster, but I was thinking that doesn't really fit with the funeral theme. Yeah. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh so anyway, um 
I don't know. What questions do you have, Josh? Anything that I may have missed? I mean, there's so much to do, so there, much to cover. There is so much to this. The best thing that a, a listener could do at this point is continue your education on the subject. And um, just frankly, not that this is something you practice, but the old phrase, practice makes perfect, uh, you can hear everything, but until you start doing it, once you start doing it, you'll get a feel for things you'll start understanding. Oh, absolutely. I think one other thing that you can help people with and something you don't, you may not even realize you're going to need to help people with, especially those who aren't prepared for this type of thing, is um, you're going to get a call. I, I know you had this call from a, a gentleman who just wasn't prepared for this type of thing yet. Um, going to help him pick out a casket. What do we put on the tombstone? Oh, yeah. Uh, we what do we do financially? That. You need as a as, this is mainly for pastors, but as a pastor, you're they're going to call you and ask, "What do I do?" And you need to go ahead and educate yourself on on what do you do uh, financially? How much you know? How much do we pay for a funeral? How much do we pay for this? Is this a good idea? Should I do this? You know, is it important to buy the most expensive casket or will the will the cheaper one at the wherever you buy your casket? You know, it, don't buy it off of Amazon. And um, I heard I don't even know if you can do that. No, you can. You can? Uh, yeah. Really? And, yeah. So <laughs> we won't get into that. And uh, you need to you need to you need to have some education on helping people <laughs> through end of life. I'm sorry. I can't let me get past the Amazon casket thing. <laughs> that's that's uh, a different podcast. I just had a my, I just had the thought of you know now I know what to do with those extra Amazon cards, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> my goodness. Here we go. Never mind. Sorry. Um, let me give you a resource real quick that can help you in as a pastor learning how to help people get everything in order. And that is a um, book entitled Set Thine House in Order. Set Thine House in Order. It's by Pastor Terrell Hopkins, um, a great friend of ours, a great preacher. I'm going to be giving away that book, by the way. Are you? I'm going to go really? over that book. I'm going to give that book to our families of our church. Good. I'm doing a Foundation for Family series. Sure. And when I get to the part about end of life and pre preparation, I'm actually going to give each family that book. Book. Good, good. Well, you can go to victoryspringsbooks.com. Again, that's victoryspringsbooks.com. Search for the book Set Thine House in Order. And it's what it's what it's um titled as is Set Thine House in Order, a practical guidebook for planning your last days. How much is that book? And so twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. It's gonna be so, an expensive one to give away. It but will. If it you want to save twenty bucks and you're a listener, come, come to, Victory to Victory Springs, Springs when we right. preach that message. Sure. And so it goes over the wisdom of preparing for death. Be prepared in your faith, be prepared in your family, be prepared in your finances, be prepared in your final days, be prepared for your funeral, uh, prepare your family for the future after you are gone. And then the last chapter is your final farewell. And so what that does is it'll actually help you in preparing for some of these things. But get good education on, you know, picking out different things because you're their pastor. And some people, they're not going to know who else to go to. So they're going to go to yeah. their pastor. Most of the times they will find a family member to go with them to the funeral home. Right. Um, I have been asked as the pastor to go and help. And I was glad I was there um, because the man whose wife had passed away, I had led, I had led her to the Lord. Um, he was um, very emotional. And, you know, they were talking about all the different kinds of caskets. And then they got to like the best, fanciest casket, you know, $20,000 for a casket. And um, when you're emotional and you're hurting and it's your loved one, you want to do the very best for them. It's your last act of saying I love you. Of per saying se. I love you. Kind yes. Of. And some people get talked into spending the most exorbitant amount of money on a casket that they don't have the money for. Right. And as their pastor as a preacher, I reassure them and say, look, you know, you don't have to buy that expensive one. Um, remember, they're not there. Okay. This is just their body. They're not even there. So it's not like, you know, and I try to steer them and say, look, this casket here, you know, this basic economy uh, is just as good. It's Remember, it's just a body. Um, and so I steer them that direction, uh, even with flowers. You know, they'll want to, especially if it's a husband dealing with a wife, sometimes they feel guilty because they never bought them flowers, you know, when they're married. And all of a sudden it's That's like... a good tip for you. Buy flowers for buy your flowers wife. Now, anyway. while she'll enjoy them instead of yeah. paying the $1,200 later. For ones that'll end up in the dumpster we found. There out, you so. go. Yes. Um and so, 
basically, there are some funeral homes that will take the flowers and take them to nursing homes and let the people use them for crafts and different things. Um, but that's kind of rare. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. I wish they did that more often, but most times they just, yeah. If you go to the dumpster after a funeral, um, you can take home as many flowers to your wife as you want. Um, not that I've done that, but just, no, you don't. <laughs> that's so bad I even said that right. <laughs> that's a pro tip right there. Pro tip. <laughs> <laughs> when you come home with like three dozen red roses and your wife's like, oh, that's thank you. It's a large you. arrangement. Don't tell her. Yeah, <laughs> one of those. <laughs> got it from my dumpster. Oh, got man. one of the okay. sprays. Never mind. And uh, um, we got off tangent there, but well, anyway. we did, didn't we? Uh, pro tips. We're offering tips pro tips. Tips to loving your wife cheaply. Um, yeah. So That's a good podcast episode. I like that. that. Is, How yeah. to show your wife love on a budget. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Dunkin' Dones dumpster after. Uh, after hey, we could talk which top 10 dumpster diving spots. That's another episode right oh, there. Oh, military base when they. Military. Yeah, that's a good one. You, you, no, you're serious on this now. Oh, I'm 100% serious. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I digress. Let's go back. Um, like flowers. So a husband will feel guilty and he'll buy the most expensive flowers. He doesn't have that kind of money. Um, and so I will steer the right direction. And um, also as a pastor, if I recognize that a family doesn't have much money, and um, you know, I even looked at this man and said, let our church buy. You know, I said, if we if we look at these flowers, I said, why don't you let our church buy this one? Because he was so distraught about buying flowers. And he says, well, I, I think I should get the most expensive ones. And I, I took the decision out of his hand. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, these ones here are beautiful. I said, what's your favorite color? And he told me, and I said, well, let's get this in the hurt color. And I said, why don't you let the church buy this one? We just took a $1,200 thing that he was about to go in debt for to a $300. It was $295, a beautiful, you know, um, a spray of, of uh, casket flowers for $295, her color. And I took the decision away from him so he didn't go into debt that way. Sure. The other thing you're going to get as a preacher, and you better be ready to answer this, is preacher. And you're sitting there, you know, at the, the funeral home with them, you know, should should we go cremation or should we go burial? Mm-hmm. And you better be ready to answer that one. And um, and so I don't know if you've ever done a podcast on that one yet. We have not. That's I've, your I've next thought one. about it. We need to do it. That's on your this, next so. one right there. Yeah. Cremation versus burial. And um, because you're going to get that. And um, just a quick note as a preacher, I never tell them which way to go. Right. I, I, I tell them they have to make that decision from those, but I can give them counsel sure. on wisdom for each one. Sure. And so that'll put a little plug for your yeah. for your next yeah. uh, podcast there. Sure. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate you being on with us today. Let me give one last plug. Um, you want to help your family? You want to help your preacher Dumpster during diving. a funeral? Dumpster diving. <laughs> you want to help? Get life insurance. Um, if you can afford it, especially as a... To me, and I'm just going to put it here, if you're a father, husband, I think it's a requirement to have it life is. insurance. It is a requirement. I, I believe. Yeah, okay, so you're, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more tender. You're like, nope, it no, is. it absolutely. is a requirement. Why in the world would you leave your wife with nothing and has to try to bury you? I agree. I, um, sorry, worst decision you're gonna you put, make. You're going to yeah. put your family in a tough spot. Now, if you're one of those people, you're rich, you can self-insure, okay, you're you're good. Know, that's fine. Most of us cannot self yeah. insure. You need to get life insurance. The Even monthly if you payment did. or whatever you have is worth it. Get a term uh, term policy and get life insurance. There's a reason yeah. you do term, not whole life. That's a different podcast and a whole different time. Get a term life insurance policy and make the payment. Look at how much. Look, I have a note on my phone right now. My wife and I share a note-taking app um, between our devices, and so we both take notes on that app. There's a note on there that says what to do if Josh dies. And I've got, here's how much the life insurance policy is. Here's by the time you're, much you get it? it home. I'm not telling you. <laughs> by the time you get it home, here's what you're going to do. You're going to pay off this, pay off this. You're going to take the extra money. You're going to put it here. Here's what you need to do to be able to survive every year. You can pull this much from the leftovers as it builds up in, yeah. in the savings. And I've got it completely set out. So she knows financially she has nothing to worry about. She knows it's written in there for one year. You don't have to worry about anything financially. And I think that's the key. And you don't have to worry. And I have it written in there. You don't actually have to worry about it for the rest of your life if you manage it well and do exactly what I tell you to do do with it. You don't have to worry about it. And I tell her, look, and one thing I want my wife to know, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. Um, She's never had to work a job outside the home. I want my wife, if I die today, we get in the car ride and I ride home and I die in a car accident, I want her to know you don't have to freak out and try and find a job next week. 
you can take this yeah. money, and if you use it this way, you don't have to worry about it. And I tell her, I don't want you to, in my notes I've written, I don't want you to get a job for a year. And the reason I don't want that is is because she doesn't have to. Yeah. And I want her to have that time to grieve. If she wants to do that after a year, so be it. She doesn't have to because I have life insurance, and I also have a plan for her on what she needs to do. Please, if you're listening today, get life insurance. Don't be so gung-ho that yeah. you think you're, you're right. You'll be fine. Your family won't be. No, exactly. You'll leave in a mess. If anything, at least the very bare minimum, you're talking five, seven bucks a month, enough money to cover your funeral expenses, at least 15 to 20,000. To Oof, cover your no, I'm saying at a minimum. If you're if you're if you're not gonna have life insurance, at least get something to cover your funeral, so they can at least stick sure. in, you know stick in the ground. Yeah, um, or lose your body and keep the twenty. One of the two. By, you know? Yeah. By the way, <laughs> funerals are expensive. Yes. Um, the one I was just talking about, um, the guy walked away with fourteen thousand dollars. Oh my! For goodness. a funeral, and that was that was basic economy everything. Yeah. See, I um, have to have life insurance just so she can yeah, actually bury me. Bury you. And so uh, I actually have life insurance. Um, I did it twenty years ago. It's up next uh, next year. Um, yeah. I pay twenty six dollars. And mine's twenty bucks a month. You're some man cheaper than mine. Seriously, you probably have it more too. Wait, yeah, we won't discuss that over the podcast. <laughs> Truth so, be told, I'm I, I I really think I need to raise my number up. I do too. The cost um, of living has gone up so yeah. much since I got that policy five years ago. Oh, uh, Twenty years ago, I was like, "You'd be rich if I die," and um, so yeah. So we have a policy on e- policy on each of us. Um, hers is like twelve bucks a month that we've been paying for twenty years, and mine's twenty six, and it's a pretty fair amount. But in today's standards, I'm looking at it like, yeah, she can she can do okay for a while, yeah. But I need up it. But it's next. It's it's yeah. I got to renew that. Right. I'm going to talk to you about some insurance, by the way. So Great. I need, I need some advice. <laughs> I don't have any advice. We'll do a podcast one day. <laughs> Lead me through how to get life insurance at 48. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> anyway, all right. So we digress. And uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and we'll call this an episode. Looking forward to next week. We have some exciting things coming up. You'll want to stay tuned. Again, I'm looking forward to next Friday. Um, If you have any questions, you can always email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Until next time, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ.